This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of the brand new PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, as well as PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPhone, PDF Pen for iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disk Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. Welcome to Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, I'm happy to welcome back Mr. Jason Snell. Jason, it's great to see you. It's been quite a while. Chuck, it's been too long. It's, it's good to see you. And we always say that, and we always say, okay, we're going to do it more often, and then we both get busy. And, you know. I know, and then, and then yeah, every now and then there's an email, and one of us can't do it and all that, so I'm glad this worked. Yeah, I am too. I am too. Um, and, and, I, and you have to forgive me, because I feel like your titles have just changed so often, because you keep climbing the ladder, Jason. So oh, is, God. It, is it president, CEO, emperor? No, no, <laughs> no, no. Editorial director for IDG Consumer. Edi so okay. I'm the editorial, I'm in charge of the editorial group that puts out uh, PC World, Mac World, and Tech Hive, and uh, that's it right now. But uh, yeah, that's who I that's who I am. So basically, I'm the editorial director for our part of IDG, uh, which is the consumer uh, portion. So it's not IDG's got a whole wing that does uh, what they call enterprise, which is business B two B. They like to call it sometimes, and that's not me. They, I'm I'm we're writing about consumer products, products that people buy instead of companies. Yeah, that's that's a great way to say it. That's exactly. I can and I was looking at a website of someone last night who I won't whose name I won't mention. And it's like, okay, they're trying to be a consumer company, but there's a lot of business stuff there, and you know the, the audience is going to get lost. Do one, do the other, break them apart logically, but don't mix. Right. Them. Yeah. Totally. So, Jason, since you were here last, it seems like you have really expanded, you personally, and I guess IDG as well, in the podcasting space. Um, I think the last time we were here, we talked about The Incomparable, which is your show. Mm. Yes. Um, Still but, going, 170-odd episodes in now. Yeah, and, and I think huh. that I've listened to every one except <laughs> those that I wasn't ready to listen to because they had spoilers. Which is fine. I, I, our most common um, iTunes, not to get off on a tangent about The Incomparable, yeah. but... Uh, one of our most common iTunes reviews is this uh, sort of apologetic. I love it, but I don't listen to every episode. Like that's sort of a, you know, there's something wrong. And it's like, no, that's the whole point. The whole point is you should be able to pick and choose the stuff you're interested in. It is meant to kind of be an anthology series of, of kind of geeky uh, pop culture. And so if there's a com if you don't read comics, don't listen to the comic episodes, although actually they're great recommendations for people who don't read comics but are interested. If you don't watch Doctor Who, don't listen to the Doctor Who episodes. If you don't if you haven't seen a movie or read a book, you can you can wait and uh, catch up on those later. And uh, hopefully it's enough of a mixture that even if we don't get you every week, we get you uh, fairly often. And, uh, that you know, it's fun. But it's definitely nobody should... I, I get all these weird apologies of like I don't listen to every episode. Like that's that was the point. That's the that's the end. It's probably really bad from a commercial standpoint that uh, you know every episode isn't a must listen. But that was the whole idea was I didn't want to do a podcast that was like. Um, a comic book podcast. I don't have a thing a week to say about comic books or TV or movies or books. I don't. I, I my interests are varied and shallow, and so I would like to spread <laughs> things around. And that's so. That's what the incomparable is. And it's interesting to hear you talk about that because that's sort of the way I look at at Mac Voices. You know, I don't expect. I'd love to have everybody listen exactly. to each one, but if we're talking about something that you're not interested in, by all means, that's okay. Go skip to the next one. Won't hurt my feelings. You know, exactly. I Please keep checking back or stay subscribed, but don't don't feel obligated. But but you all do a nice mixture, like you say, of 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 all kind of of tech and or tech oriented, geek oriented stuff that I I really enjoy. What does that mean, Jason? And and I'll, and what, I, I'm going to take this in just a, a direction, very short, a very short uh, change here. But what does it mean that you're starting to see this this kind of culture get? popularity gets more mainstream acceptance does it mean that the geeks won eh, wow yeah this is uh that's a great topic actually i should do a another we did one episode sort of about this yeah i mean there was a time when obviously geeky stuff is more popular now than it used to be and there's actually i mean the concept of geek chic actually floors me because those two things did not go together um you know nerdiness is not cool right except now nerdiness to a certain extent might be cool and 
Part of it is uh, just trends. Part of it is the internet and people who were isolated before um, not feeling isolated. And I think part of it is that popular culture is now being run by people who came of age as uh, geeky people in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s. And so you see... You see incredibly talented people who were raised on what was at the time stuff that was targeted mostly at juveniles, but they they became adults and still loved that stuff, and even though they were told that they sh- should grow up and stop paying attention to superheroes, right? That that is the most, I, and that is a topic I want to do on the incomparable. Sometime is you know what have we have we all failed to grow up or not? But you look at somebody like Joss Whedon who is a very talented uh, writer, and even if you don't like the Avengers or something like that, I mean, mean, very talented writer has taken all that he learned about popular culture and geeky stuff and applied it in a a more uh, populist way. Or if you look at uh, Stephen Moffat and Russell Davies, who were the two showrunners for Doctor Who when it came back, they took a show that they loved as kids and re-spun it as something that is actually... um, pretty widely popular in the UK and the US now. And uh, I, so I, part of it, I think, is that, is that a lot of the people who are holding um, the keys of pop culture are not afraid to uh, follow the path of their uh, their kind of geekier pursuits. Somebody like Christopher Nolan, who is a, a very good director and could be super serious and take himself super seriously, I think he actually does, but he still made three Batman movies, right? I think they're... I think that's uh, I think that's some of what's going on, and and like I said, I think also the internet that that uh, the isolation people felt about these enthusiasms that they weren't supposed to have, and now they they can have them and not feel like they're weird or different, but that they've got a whole community of people who like it. And so I think you know, plus you know, bottom line, Star Wars I think also is a part here where Star Wars changed the culture, and since Star Wars in 1977, we have been flooded with summer blockbusters. The single most popular piece of entertainment uh, created on planet Earth is the Hollywood blockbuster. And, you know, you tell me, I I would say almost every Hollywood blockbuster, a vast majority, are what we would probably call sci-fi, fantasy kind of movies. And so that has uh, a reinforcing effect, too. So that's my stock five minute answer to that question, I guess. But it's fascinating. It's amazing. Who would have predicted? Who would yeah. have predicted? Yeah, I mean you look back and think about in the seventies, eighties, when we were all coming up, uh, those things were definitely niche things. They were oh yeah. They, they were not popular. Uh, well that's not true. They they were popular to a degree, but they were popular reportedly with a certain age group and a right. certain I guess demographic that it's kid stuff and yeah. guys who didn't grow up who should have moved on to other things but are in a state of arrested development in their in their twenties and thirties. That that was basically the yeah. tag, right? Was that you got to grow up and stop? I mean, I did that. I got rid of all my Doctor Who stuff when I went to college. I thought, well, uh, time to put the childish things away and move on with my life. And now I find myself regretting that I got rid of that stuff because you know the show came back and I I have a, a great fondness for it. But I I went through that phase of saying I'm going to put this stuff away because this is not. What uh, what you're supposed to do when you're uh, when you're an adult, and also it's not going to help you get girls. So, <laughs> <laughs> which turns out to also be completely untrue because uh, geek fandom is full of women, and yeah. it's you know so that's also wrong. Turns yeah. out, yeah. And I I think there's something to be said for and Chris Green and I love to argue this back and forth about musical tastes, but. Just because you like something, you know, at one age doesn't mean you have to not like it at another or that you can grow beyond it. Sure, there are some things definitely that you do, but, it, you know, once a Batman fan, always a Batman fan. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, you know, your your standards change, I think. I mean, I... <laughs> I was very, when I read lots of comics when I was a kid, I was obviously a kid. And like John Syracuse says, kids have bad taste. It's, you, you know, you you haven't been exposed to things. You don't know what to do. You just judge it as, oh, that was cool and Spider-Man was in it or whatever. And now as an adult, you know, and this is, I think, why we see stories that are more like this is because the, the, the adults who were those kids who are raised on that, they're trying to apply adult sensibilities to those things. So now if I read a Batman story or a Spider-Man story, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge it differently. And I want it to have a level of story sophistication that the comics of the 70s and 80s didn't have, but the fact is they they generally do because the people writing them are people like me who want that extra layer of sophistication, and that's a that's a good thing. I mean, we, we live in an age where um, where Michael Chabon could write a Pulitzer Prize winning novel that's essentially about 
uh, the creation of the golden age of comic books. And he is a gigantic nerd who wrote what is considered a mainstream novel, even though it, it is a really geeky novel, and it won the Pulitzer. So what kind of crazy upside-down world are we living in? But that shows that you can take it to a, a much more sophisticated place with the you know, with you're still playing with action figures, but you're having them have existential crises instead of just bashing each other. <laughs> yeah, and you you just mentioned it. You're a Spider-Man guy, and and we're not going to turn am. this into an episode of The Incomparable. But <laughs> one, one day we're going to have that discussion about you know why Spider-Man resonated so much with you, because I, I, I you've you've indicated that a couple times or hinted at it at the show, and I I wanted. Delve deep into your psyche about that. But we, we should do a, a Batman versus Spider Man episode of The Incomparable <laughs> sometime, too. That would be interesting. I'd get Tony Sindelar to tell me all the great things about Batman, and I could counter with Spider Man. And yeah, well, and it, it, whatever happens to hit you, and some of it is just serendipity. You, you know, you're a kid, and you. You know, my ex my my exposure to Batman was largely the Adam West TV show, which was you know fun and all that. But I, I never really thought of him as a, a comic book guy. I didn't it, for whatever reason I didn't get exposed to the Batman comics at that age, and I did get exposed to the Spider Man comics, and that was it. I mean, I, sometimes I think it's that simple, but obviously it has to resonate. Yeah. Um, and then that and yeah, it's a combination of nostalgia and and something you loved in your childhood, and that's absolutely part of it. And then uh, and then as an adult, can you? You know, can you apply your adult sensibility to a character like that, and and are those stories still fulfilling for you? And that can vary widely. And some Spider-Man stuff is terrible, and some of it is good. But uh, you know, I'll always have a soft spot for that character. Yeah. Well, okay, to pull it back now a little bit to right. to podcasting. Podcast. That well, that was that was the incomparable. But yep. I'm also watching you all produce um, te the Tech Hive podcast. Right, so we got we have Clockwise Tech Clockwise, Clockwise podcast, right. and then the Macro podcast, podcast is still going. Right, um, and yeah, I mean, we're not doing anything like at the at the scale of Rene Ritchie, who uh, is producing like eight podcasts for for Mobile Nations, which totally blows me away, and I don't know how he does it. Honestly, podcasting for me is a labor of love, and I, this is the, my challenge at, at the at the office. Uh, I mean, that's why I do The Incomparable in my spare time. I really believe in this medium. The challenge at our business is that we have a, a, you know, we have a sales force that is really devoted to selling display ads on the internet or video pre-roll ads and things like that. And podcast sponsorship doesn't actually just doesn't work for them. In fact, to the point where we've now outsourced it to a third party to sell sponsorships. Um, I would love to continue growing the the podcasts we do it's a challenge because it's a challenge to get people to prioritize it uh from development standpoint our podcast pages are just kind of like article pages um you know th there's a challenge there i'm not sure podcasting is a medium that a large corporations get at this point and so while i want to do them because i want to be there i also don't want to go overboard because i'm not sure you know there is an effort there and also i can't wrestle my entire company into doing podcasting myself just out of love. I, I Renee may be doing that, but I, I, I can't do that. Um, so I'm doing Phil Michaels and Chris Breen do the Macworld podcast and I'm occasionally on there. And then clockwise is me and Dan Morin. And I actually book and schedule and edit that one. Um, which if anybody out there hasn't listened, um, search for clockwise I, in some podcast directories, you'll find two of them because we had an old tech high podcast that we, canceled and redirected and the effect was that it made two of the same podcast anyway but it's called tech eyes clockwise podcast and the idea is that it's a 30 minute long weekly discussion of tech topics with me dan morin and two people we pluck generally from the editors of pc world macworld and tech hive so it's short it's not a two and a half hour long podcast like some of the ones out there and yet we think we cover a varied number of topics so we're trying to trying to do something different and it's fun but i'm not sure i would launch more podcasts at IDG right now, mostly because I feel like uh, if I'm going to spend my time, I'm, I probably should spend my time doing something that's aligned a little bit more with, uh, with the priorities of my business. And so that probably what I'm thinking of now is, is can I take what I've learned with podcasting and apply it to something that's maybe more video oriented just because they are selling and excited about video advertising and they really want as many video views on our websites as possible and podcasting just doesn't work for them. So that's what I'm trying to explore now is, is to figure out if, uh, if uh, maybe I can apply those lessons and, and, and do something with, with, uh, with video. But I, I love podcasting. I'm really a believer in the medium, um, huge believer in the medium. I'm just not sure 
like I said, whether um, some whether larger publishing companies are really capable of not it's not even understanding it is like capable of prioritizing it because you got to be patient, you got to build an audience. It is an, a geekier kind of audience, and the sponsorship uh, p- potential there is nice, but it's uh, you know it's never going to be the same kind of thing as they see from the you know what they've got their all their commission salespeople out there selling. So it's always going to be a tougher sell. It, it is, but I also look at it and think. The, the audiences may not be as large, but they're so much more focused. Agreed. And and, and that, that to me, you know, it, it really fascinates me when I think about somebody buying a, a magazine advertisement and knowing automatically that, you know, X percentage of the audience is not going to be ever interested in their product. Whereas yep. with podcasting, if you if you're podcasting or advertising on the incomparable, you have a pretty good idea of that demographic because the subject matter is fairly tight and focused. And so I look at it and think, you know, it should be it should be an advertiser's delight, perhaps not a salesperson's delight, but, but yeah. an advertiser's delight, and how to communicate that. The other thing, though, Jason, I want to ask you about though is what, and I know I've heard you talk about this a little bit. What seems to be an explosion of podcasting, and is it is it because people do it as a labor of love, or is it because it's a more focused medium, or do you just feel like you have to be there just in case it really does catch fire and have legs to it? I think you have stated um, a bunch of reasons that are good reasons, and I think it's all of those things. I think it's uh, the bar to do podcasting is lower, um, although, you know, the, as with anything, you need, you know, better microphones and, you know, more editing and things like that to make. I, I, there's some podcasts I listen to or I try to listen to from people who I think are really good, and I start to listen, and it sounds so terrible that I give up. Uh, because, you know, I just, I need it to, (laughs) it's just like bad echoey microphones and phone lines and it's not good. So, but the bar is low. You can get it out there on the internet. You can use SoundCloud or you can use Squarespace or you can use, you know, there are lots of cheap or free ways to do it. So that's part of it. Uh, part of it is that, um, you know, uh, it's an interesting medium that has the connection. I was, we did a meetup for the incomparable and for Glenn Fleischman's magazine, um, last week. And, uh, I was telling people that I, I have had so many people interested in, um, uh, what I've, what I've, uh, said on podcasts versus the 15 years that I've been writing articles on paper and on screens. And it's because I truly believe there is a different part of your brain that processes when you're listening to somebody's voice and it connects with whatever your community kind of judgment parts of your brain are. And it feels like you're listening to a friend, some member of your community, and it creates that connection and words on a page as great as they are. And as much as we love them, don't do that. And, and so that's a big deal. And I do believe that's at the root of podcast uh, power. So I think that's a part of it. And yes, I mean, it's also because it's a burgeoning medium and the last thing you want to do is be left um, on the outside looking in. I, I'd say what it's not is a cash grab. And although there is money in the podcast world now at a level that it wasn't a couple of years ago, that there are sponsors, that, you know, the Incomparable has sponsors now, which is I, I did largely because I wanted to see what would happen if we did them and because I wanted to see if that meant I could do some nice things for my panel and I could build a a uh, little corner of my garage to use as a as a as an office to do some of this stuff instead of getting in the middle of my family when they were trying to do other things and and quite honestly also as a backup in case I felt like my uh, my uh, something happened to my job and I needed to quit my job could I make at least a little bit of a living on podcasting and the answer is eh, kind of I'd say don't nobody nobody should do podcasting for the money, but there is some money out there and it can be an inducement or it can be a, a sweetener. So that's part of it too. But I don't think we've reached the point where we entered the cash grab proceedings because you have to build, you know, incomparable. It's got about 20,000 listeners and it took us three years to get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, you know, uh, three years of weekly, I believe we've done in a hundred and we've done about 173 episodes and I counted it in it. That's like in about 173 weeks. It's literally, on average, an episode a week for three years to get there. So it's not a cash grab at all because, you know, even to get to 20,000, it took us three years. Yeah, I, you know, and, and I think there's a difference between podcasting and blogging. And it's interesting to see the way the two have, have paralleled yet diverged. They're similar, right? I mean, right. The, the bar is low. 
lower, but it's higher than blogging. Um, but still, anybody can do it, but you do need a level of technical knowledge. I mean, I have a friend of mine who's a professional writer for a major publication. Uh, he's been doing it a long time, and he's been trying to do podcasting, and previously his podcasts were under the aegis of his publisher, and um, that was... Um, he had people to edit his podcast for him. And now he, he doesn't, and it's hard because he's not a very technical person. He's great on the microphone, but he's not a very technical person. So the bar is lower than having to get a radio station, but it's, it's higher than blogging. There's no doubt because with blogging, you can just sign up for a, an account at a, at, a, at a blog site somewhere and start typing and press save, right? You sign up for Tumblr and start typing, and it's, it's more than that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think that's one reason that, that people start podcasting and then stop more than they start blogging and stop. Yeah. It, it's much more of a commitment in time and resources and effort. And then if you kick it up to video, it's even more of an effort and there are a lot more technical problems. So I, I would tell anybody to try it, but just be warned that it's not, it's not easy and it, it, if you're going to be any kind of successful at it, you're going to have to really commit to it and do it. And then, yeah, when when Daniel Jalkut stopped doing um, uh, core intuition, I think um, was that it? No, bit splitting. Bit, bit splitting. splitting. He's still doing yeah. core intuition with Matt and Reese. Uh, when he stopped doing bit splitting, I killed that podcast. I was the last guest. <laughs> um, I uh, I told Daniel. Um, Podcasting's hard. Don't feel bad about it. It's really hard. It's really hard. And people don't realize it. Um, and, and, you know, there's the flush of doing something new, and then there's the grind. And, you know, it can be a good grind. It can be you can get into a rhythm, but it's still you're going to have off weeks. And um, Glenn Fleischman found this out, I think. Well, actually, Marco really found it out when he started doing the magazine that um, doing – Software and doing publications are so different. And on software, you are always building your product and doing releases and doing updates. And and so in, in that way, it's sort of similar to the media, but the difference in the media is you do a story or an issue or a podcast episode and you release it and you're done with it and you move on to make a new one the next time, whatever your cycle is, new article, new, new magazine, new podcast episode. And um, that can be a real grind. And I think Marco found out, you know, doing articles every two weeks, you know, that there's an ebb and flow, I think, to software development that you just, you can't do it when you've got something where you've got an audience that's expecting something new on a, on a regular schedule. You can't flake out. So once that flush of the fun of creation um, wears off, you end up in this place where, you know, you know, you do it, I do it, where, you know, you've got to do it. And some weeks you're not feeling up to it and it doesn't matter. you got to do it. I mean, you can you can skip, but then you're telling your audience, I, I failed you this week. Sorry, come back next week. And uh, so that's the thing. After doing Incomparable for 170 whatever weeks, I mean, it's y y there's a pace to it and there's some strategies to keep it uh, fresh. Um, but, uh, you know, and if it was just a grind, I would stop. Right. But, um but it's hard, and the and and doing it for a lengthy period of time is hard. I, I'm really liking these podcasts that now are coming out and saying they're doing series or seasons, where they say we're going to do like um, Dan Moore and Lex Friedman are doing this thing called not playing, where they watch a movie that one of them or both of them has never seen, and that is built as a season. So they're going to do twelve or thirteen episodes of it, and then that'll be it, and then they'll come back at some other time if it's successful and do more. And I like, I kind of like that other than there's the whole thing of, um, if you do a one shot podcast, you get everybody to subscribe. And then what happens that, you know, then you've put all that effort into building an audience and it's gone. That's a, that's not great, but I like the idea of saying, we'll, we'll do them, but we're not doing them every week. We'll do them for 13 weeks and then we're going to go away and then we'll come back in a year and do 13 more. Um, because that's, I think that'll let more people podcast without this feeling like unless they um, commit to doing it every week until the end of time, they should just not do it because that's sort of what happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I value your opinions in this area because you you straddle both worlds. I mean, you've had – and it's not like you did a, you know, a, a, a five-episode season or ten-episode season. You've done 176 of Incomparable. It's still going. You've – managed or watched or presided over whatever the proper term is uh, the Macworld podcast you know clockwise so you have a good feel for for both sides of of that area of of those areas and and I 
that's why I value your opinion and, and was kind of anxious to hear just what you thought about where we stand with this particular medium. Yeah, I love it. I mean, that, that's the bottom line is I love it. Um, I do. I am a believer in it. And uh, I think the challenge is going to be how more people find it. I, I think the big problem with podcasting is uh, how do you find podcasts? I mean, I, I still hear from people who are like, you have a what now? A podcast? How do I get that? And you know, most podcast listeners, I think, are people who are listening to it in places like in their car. So, how do you get podcasts in a car in an easy way? I, nobody has cracked that yet. And podcasts have grown, the audience has grown, but, you know, the radio audience is enormous. And this could kill, you know, a lot of aspects of radio if pe more people knew about it. But how does that happen? That's going to take technology. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a great opportunity for popularizing podcasts further. But when you find them, it totally works. I, it it, it's amazing the power of it. So, yeah. you know, that's the, that's the next step is, is how do we get uh, more people to even know that they exist? Um, because the stuff is good. It is of, you know, a lot of it is a professional quality and you can find something that you really love and you don't need it to reach 200,000 people. It can reach 15,000 and that's fine. And um, that's one of the great things about podcasting. I agree. This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of the brand new PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, as well as PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPhone, PDF Pen for iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disc Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. I'm not completely sold on New Year's resolutions. But if I was, I would decide to buy and learn at least one new productivity utility per month for 2014. That shouldn't be too hard, and the benefits would be huge if I picked the right utilities. And the one I would start with is Text Expander from Smile. At its most basic level, Text Expander is easy to learn. Just decide what text you want to use, type or paste it into a snippet, select an abbreviation to trigger that snippet, and you'll be able to use it in any program on your Mac. From a simple email signature to pages of boilerplate language for a contract, Text Expander starts saving you time and keystrokes right out of the box. Then add another snippet and another and another. Soon, your snippet library and Text Expander will be a key part of your productivity recipe. Then start to explore some of Text Expander's other uses and capabilities like using it to automatically fix those annoying typos that are unique to you, or loading in the Tidbits autocorrect library to help you correct other commonly made typos, or using Text Expander to fill out forms. The list goes on and on. Next, sync your snippets through the cloud so you can use them with Text Expander Touch for your iPhone and iPad. Easy to learn, easy to implement, but immensely powerful Text Expander will quickly become your favorite Mac utility, one you can't live without. Download it now from the Mac App Store or get a free trial and buy direct from smilesoftware.com. Smile, the makers of Text Expander and other world class software titles. Thanks to Smile for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. So let's let's shift back over and talk Apple a little bit. Oh um, yeah, because I've now, heard of them. Yeah, I, I, I kind of thought you might have. Um, you know, when we come to the end of the year, there's a, 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 a time for us, I think, to you know reflect a little bit. And I've, I'm never a big fan of the as I told Jim Dalrymple a couple of shows ago. I'm never a big fan of you know doing the, the top ten stories. Yeah, yeah, let's do a list. Yeah, oh God, <laughs> you know, please. I mean, that is such a such a, a cop out, but. I asked him to talk about some of the big trends in tech, and I'm going to ask you to talk about the, the trends in Apple, Jason, from where you sit. Um, you know, we are, are we in the era, era now of Johnny Ive as a dominant force within Apple, or is Apple and is Apple too design focused at this point? I mean, those are some of the first, the two of the first things that jumped to my mind in looking at Apple at the end of 2013. Apple. Uh, I think Apple's always been design focused, but uh, if, if uh, on the Macro podcast the other week, we uh, Phil Michaels asked what the uh, who was going to look back in 2013 and say that was my year, and and one of the answers was Johnny Ive, and I think that's uh, dead on. I think this is the year that Apple embraced that Johnny Ive can fulfill the creative side of the Apple executive brain that Steve Jobs did before. 
Um, cause Tim, Tim Cook's not that guy. Nobody's going to be Steve Jobs, right? Nobody can be Steve Jobs. So, but Johnny Ive has proven himself and he's taking on some new challenges. And I think some of the choices in iOS 7 are great. And I think iOS 7 was a necessary step, but I think that there are also missteps there and there's going to be some lessons learned. And I think that's all good. Um, so I, I, I do think that Apple is in an interesting place where they are, uh, they, they had to revisit iOS this year. And uh, like I said, I really like iOS 7, but I, 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 there are definitely weird things about it. And it's essentially iOS Part 2 1.0. Um, and it is a 1.0. I, I think there's a lot to be said for the, that the, the way it's designed is different and interesting and still has some issues. But it's a... Um, that was a huge deal for them. I think the future of the Mac is still throw, thrown out there of uh, where is it going? John Syracuse has said that Mavericks is, uh, I think the phrase he used is, you've come to me at a strange time in my life. <laughs> it's the Mavericks is probably going to become something else but uh, with the next release. But Mavericks is about sort of unbecoming what it was. Um, taking off the leopard skins and the uh, stitched leather and things like that. And so that's a funny place to be. So where the Mac goes from here, it looks to me like um, the previous regime really wanted to push iOS and Mac OS together and that the, the new regime doesn't, or at least doesn't think that's a high priority. Um, because the last release, Snow Leopard, was really all about syncing up everything between macOS and iOS, including some look and feel. And I think they want to stay keep their services in sync, but I don't think they want to keep the look and feel in sync because they are different products. Uh, we'll see when whatever next year's iOS or and macOS release are. But um, so there's that. And then on the hardware side, you know, there's more iteration, which is sort of typical Apple. They keep on iterating. We didn't get that groundbreaking new product this year. Uh, they did manage the neat trick of shipping a Retina Mini iPad, which I didn't think they were going to do. But, but their competitors certainly raised the uh, bar there, and they managed to clear it uh, because there were so many other high-res small tablets on the market that it was they were really going to be hurting if they didn't do it. And they did it. Um, and they did a good job with it. And the fact that it's not a Me Too, you know, last year's processor and in, in this year's package kind of thing also was pretty impressive. Um, and the other thing I'd say about Apple this year, and this was my answer on the Macworld Pundit Showdown last week, was uh, uh, if I had to describe Apple in one word in 2013, I'd say feisty. I felt like uh, this was the year that they came really out of Steve Jobs' shadow, and Phil Schiller say, you know, famously said, can't innovate my ass on <laughs> stage. And, uh, you know, I, I think Apple's executives have truly embraced now the idea that uh, what Steve Jobs said, which is, uh, stop asking, what would I do? Uh, and go out and do stuff yourself. And, and Tim Cook has shown a, um, an interest and ability to uh, make decisions and even reverse decisions that Steve Jobs made uh, or, or pet projects of his. Getting rid of, of uh, Scott Forstall was obviously going to lead him down that path. But again, again, you know, more in Jonathan Ive, who was also a trusted confidant of, of Steve Jobs, but more like we're going to do what we think is right for Apple and um, I like that. I like to see that because they can't, my, Apple may succeed or fail. Who knows what they're going to do going forward. You, you never know that about any company, but I know they would have failed if all they tried to do was imagine Steve Jobs because they aren't Steve Jobs and he's not around. So instead, they're uh, trying to find a new way and they'll have their stumbles and they'll have some successes. And I think this year was pretty good for them. They're making a lot of money. Um, but I, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that they are willing to uh, go against some of the common uh, conventional wisdom of uh, how Apple does things. And they've done some things that were really unpredictable. And I think they will continue to do that. And I think that's great. Because for a few years there, in the last five years or so of Jobs being the CEO, um, they, were in a, they settled into a pattern. And the products were great, but they were also in a pattern, you could call it a rut, but it was certainly a pattern. And in the last year or so, they've really broken out of that pattern. And that's a good sign, I think. I'm going to take that as a good sign. Do you feel that the, and I don't think, well, I don't know if you've had your hands on one. I certainly haven't. But do you feel like the Mac Pro is an indication of some of those changes? And, and I get torn in looking at it and listening to all the comments about 
no internal storage, no internal this, you know, none of that. Have to connect everything to it. I I I start to wonder if if Johnny Ives. Um, Design sensibilities have have run amok, or is this really something truly new and innovative, and we need to look at it that way, as opposed to what we've had before in the cheese grater that you could stuff full of all kind of tech? Well, I think the new Mac Pro is the is you know quintessentially Apple-y. It is it is the Appleist Apple product. It, you know the Appleist Apple product. It is the I'm, the Appleist. I'm going to use that, Jason, that's, of all the good. Apple products. Well, I mean, look at it this way, um, and I and I don't mean that necessarily. I, I, for better and worse, it is the Apple most Apple of products because if you look back, this is right out of the Steve Jobs playbook. Actually, this is creating something that is forward looking, that is cool, and that probably omits stuff that will need to be omitted eventually. But mm, people right today still want, even though they probably shouldn't. I mean, not to abstract this too much, but uh, if you, I'm going to go back to the original iMac. Uh, everybody still had floppies. Uh, there was no floppy drive. Everybody still had serial and ADB. There was no serial. There was no ADB. It was USB only. Nobody had anything USB. And Apple said, too bad. And they said, this is our mainstream product that everybody's going to buy. This is not even an esoteric thing. So the Mac Pro is like that. And yes, it's for professional customers and professional customers have special needs. But what it is, is Apple saying, look, we are not going to make devices with spinning disks in them anymore. We're just not going to do it. Spinning disks are going away. And if you really have a need for gigantic spinning disk storage, um, Apple shouldn't be in that business. You should figure out, you know, you can chain a bunch of Firewire or Thunderbolt or whatever hard drives off of it or USB hard drives, I suppose, if you want to. Um, I think there's a suggestion there, and this is actually really intriguing stuff that I'm hoping we'll write about more on Macworld. Um, once you need a lot of storage and you can't put it in your computer, it allows you to think a little bit differently about things and start talking about things like NAS um, or, you know, things like a Drobo or anything like that or, or whether you really need that stuff uh, accessible all the time. You know, and if you do, you do. But, you know, if you're uh, in a video, high-end video environment, you've probably got fiber channel going to some big server somewhere. Um, so... You know, we'll see how it is. It, it definitely is going to cause short-term pain for people, but I, I feel like, and it is design-driven, but when has Apple not been design-driven to a certain extent? That's the whole point, is that design, design is about uh, formulating a, uh, the product that they think is going to be, you know, best used and not about fulfilling those check boxes. And in this case, Apple thinks the, you know, hard drive bays are a checkbox. And that people can live without them, and just like optical drives and laptops. And if you really need it, you can attach it on the outside. But Apple's saying, look, we're not going to do it. We don't think this is a way. We're not going to cripple our designs, and we're also not going to just get in the business of supporting spinning disks, for example. Uh, very aptly. Uh, it will cause people pain. There will be people who don't upgrade to the Mac Pro. And there will be a lot of people who are going to have to use this as an opportunity. You, you hear... Marco and John and Casey on Accidental Tech Podcast, which I listen to uh, frequently, uh, weekly. Um, they talk about this all the time because those guys are, you know, John especially is a Mac Pro user, and they're there, and Marco is, and they're concerned about the storage stuff. And what it's led them to do is explore things that aren't stick a bunch of drives in my computer. And I think that's, uh, I think that's what's going to happen to a lot of people. And Apple's going to get people out of their comfort zone. That's not new. But, um, you know, in a couple of years, three years, or, or if we look at back at the cheese grater, I mean, cheese grater has been around for like a decade now. My daughter, when the G5 came out, which is the first cheese grater, um, my daughter was like uh, one, I think. Uh, it was a long time ago because I remember I had to take her. My wife and, and my daughter and I all went down to Apple for my briefing because we were on our way to Southern California for a family trip. And the only time they could do the briefing was that morning. So we went and somebody from Apple PR actually took them to the company store. And it was, it was sweet of them to do that. But I can, so I can peg when that thing came out. It was a long time ago. So if we keep this Mac Pro design for five or 10 years, uh, <laughs> I think it's pretty clear that if we look at five or 10 years, nobody's going to have spinning disks in a computer that's in your house. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be some other better way of storage. So this is Apple saying, yeah, we're designing for uh, 2020. We're not designing for today because this thing's going to be around a while. And that's very Apple. So I totally get the criticism of it. 
Uh, I just think that it's the same kind of criticism you can level against all sorts of Apple products over the last uh, 10 or 15 years because this is what Apple does and it pisses people off, but it's what they do. <laughs> it's what they do. And this is no different. No, it's, and, and I think I applaud you for taking the longer view because I think that it, there is a, a sense that they stepped back and re-looked at things and said, you know, okay, how much right now, what do we have? Four terabyte drives, 3.5 inch drives. So how many more terabytes can they squeeze into that form factor? Or do we have to go with something brand new? And, you know, how long can we ride with this new design? Funny, I had a funny experience yesterday. Um, I've had an airport that went a little flaky. And so I was going to plug it in, you know, plug it in directly to the Mac to, you know, run an airport utility through Ethernet. And I've only got one Mac left that has an Ethernet port. Now, I can get an adapter to plug it into Thunderbolt, no problem. But kind of the point was, wow, I, I sort of missed that, that it disappeared on me, and I didn't didn't even notice it. You know, that was one that they just quietly dropped out, and with Wi-Fi becoming so ubiquitous, a lot of people didn't notice it. Yeah, or like when they, they dropped the modem port at one point, and you could still buy a dongle, and who bought a dongle, and yeah. eventually nobody bought a dongle. Spinning disks are not going to be around in consumer applications, because they're, they're, they're loud, they're hot. They're really unreliable. Why, I, I, Apple does not want to have spinning disks in their supply chain. They just they don't, and pretty soon they won't. And that's uh, you know, and people who need lots and lots and lots of storage who need something that's based on spinning disks are going to go to somebody who specializes in that and probably has a better experience than a drive slapped in a computer from Apple. So, you know, it, but it's not, you know, they're taking the long view. I'm not taking the long view. I'm just, I guess I'm acknowledging that that clearly the Mac Pro is it. one of the meetings they had when they were talking about design was think about what this product is going to be like in eight years, because the last design we did has been here for eight years or nine years. And, and, uh, and it's going to be like that. And imagine a world where are these trends going and spinning disks is like the easy one. It's like, it's gone. They're gone. They're not going to be regular people don't, don't need it. SSDs are going to get better and better and better, and spinning disks are bad, and Apple clearly thinks spinning disks are bad. So pretty soon, the only spinning disk in a new Apple product is going to be the iPod Classic. Think about that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, you just blew me right away. I hadn't even thought okay, about time, that. Okay, Time Capsule and the iPad, iPod yeah. Classic. I guess that, that'll be it. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. No, you're right. It, in a way, it's, it may be good that they're not setting people up to fail because we all know that you, you put two drives in an iPad Pro cheese grater, you don't raid them, you don't mirror them, you use both to their fullest capacity, so yeah, you have twice as much data to lose. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I do, I do, I do cloud backup, I do, I do backup in my house, I do have three two terabyte hard drives chained off of a Mac mini behind my TV set that I do use as a server. Uh, I should, if I hadn't bought the drives and all that, I mean, these days I, I keep thinking that I should get NAS too. And, and that, that, you know, network attached storage and cloud backup and all those things, those all need to be better. Um, I think you could argue pretty strongly that Apple's not the company to make those better. And that's fine. Uh, because I think if a Apple tried, it, they wouldn't make it better. They would make it uh, not as good. So let companies that specialize in that do that and do that well. And meanwhile, Apple is going to just kind of step back and say, you know, third-party opportunity, which is also very Apple. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny. Storage is still an issue. Uh, but between cloud storage and online backups and stuff you can buy if you really want to do it yourself. And, you know, I think regular people are going to not do that so much anymore, but I think geeks are going to do it and that's fine. I think, I think we're in a much better place. I'd much rather have a, a NAS or something today than, you know, five different drives that I plug and unplug at a, any given time. Yeah. Agreed. It, and it's funny how we have started to move in that direction. Um, it, w and frankly, whether it's network attached or not, whether it's direct attached, but sure. just a big pool of storage instead of trying to juggle, you know, this drive to that drive to that drive. And where are the movies? Where are the TV shows? Where's the music? Where are my pictures? You know, on which drive do I put them in? By the way, as soon as I start trying to put two or three of those categories on one drive, I run out of space. Yep. It, it's, it, it's definitely a, a 21st century problem. Although I found that with, um, you know, where where is this going? I don't hesitate uh, as much about buying movies on iTunes now because I know I don't have to find space for two or three or four gigabytes of data because they're all on the cloud now and you can download them as many times as you want. And that's 
a big change where all of a sudden I don't need that storage. I buy the movies, but I don't need the storage. I can use it if I want to have a local copy, but I don't need to have a local copy. And and that's where a lot of this stuff is going. And as networks get faster, I mean, yeah, you're always going to need faster storage, but I think that's sort of what Apple's thinking with the Mac Pro is that your SSD is almost like your cache. It's your local cache of high-speed storage. And then somewhere else is where your files that you know you need slower access to live. And you know whether that's uh, on a on an attached drive or a NAS or it's in the cloud. Uh, that's sort of where. And, and again, for geeky people, it's going to be harder and more complicated, and their standards are going to be higher than maybe kind of the average consumer. But you know, I think we're all going there. And even somebody like me who gets a little control freaky about this stuff has to you know accept that uh, sometimes it's some you know sometimes you have to give up some control, but you gain some. Um, you gain some convenience from it. And I, I feel like some of the cloud stuff that's already starting to happen. This reminds me of some comments about eBooks that, you know, <laughs> and, and, and the one thing that everybody does not like about eBooks is you can't share them. You can't t t turn them over to a, a neighbor or a friend and say, here, read this. And yet I, I, I look at that and think, well, that's the least of the problems because, you know, they're so convenient. And I've said this on the show a number of times as someone who recently cleaned out an old house and moved a lot of books, I'd much rather have them stored on a Kindle or an iPad than, you know, 25 cartons at about 40, 50 pounds each. Yep. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's just not got a good a, idea. I gave away all the books that I didn't think to the, I don't add them to the library that I didn't think were collectible in some way, signed or, or really pretty, not just text on a page, but really mm -hmm. pretty, um, or had some sort of personal meaning. Uh, the others, uh, we offloaded and, and made our, we still have lots of books, but not as many as we did. And I, I would ask myself the question, would I rather save this book? I, am I ever going to read it again? And if I do want to read it again, I can probably get it for 2 or $3 or $5. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'm, I'm willing to take that chance to get, you know, hundreds of books out of my life. And likewise, I've got... I've got CDs still in an envelope somewhere out here uh, that <laughs> that are all the CDs that I bought, but they don't get played. They got ripped, and now they're auto, you know, they're iTunes matched, and it's not even based on what was on the CDs. They've just, fing you know, fingerprinted them and provided a high-quality, you know, 192 AAC. I, I was going to have to re-rip. For a long time, I was re still re-ripping MP3s because I didn't have them a high, at a high enough bit rate. And then with iTunes Match, it's like, okay, now I have no reason to get those discs out at all. Um, that's This is where we are is, you know, that, that a lot of that stuff is just going to fall by the wayside, and I'm fine with it. Yeah. It's, and it takes an, – it's an adjustment in thinking. There's no question about Huge. it. Huge. And, and it'll hit people on the edges who – there are always going to be people who are like, no, but I can't do it because of X. And that's true. And if you're one of the people on the edges, that can stink. But, you know, at some point you have to accept that even if you have five reasons why it's not good for you, you, you know, that maybe it's, it is good for 90%, 80% of people. Mm -hmm. And that's – you know, for a lot of the stuff, that's that's the case. I, I don't love that that ebooks can't be given away, but um, you know, I don't I, I don't love that. That's that's a that's a downside and that's a trade off. I don't I don't love that the that uh, libraries uh, and ebooks don't play better together, uh, but they don't yet, and maybe they will sometime, and that would be great. But right now, you've got um, publishers and and ebook sellers want to do this you know single person sale thing, and in exchange, you get convenience. And you know that's something, and, but it's not it's not quite the same. But you know, again, I I ride a bus to work almost every day, and um, I was never going to take a hardcover book with me. And I read so many more books now that I use a Kindle because I can take the Kindle with me or have it on my iPad. Yep, Jason, I don't want to take too much of your time, so let's wrap up with with your thoughts on where Apple needs to go, not where they will go. I don't want predictions, but where do you think that they need to go in 2014? And you can take that on the desktop, you can take it on the phone, you can take it on the iPad or the tablet market. What do they need to one. do? It's a good one. Wow, that's a, that's a big question. I would say, um, not that I'm giving Apple advice, they are very smart, but um, I think Apple needs to continue trying to reach um, audiences in parts of the world, especially for the phone, but also for the iPad, that in parts of the world that uh, for the phone can't, you know, they don't have subsidized phones 
and Apple's phones are still too expensive. And in, in the U.S., where we have subsidies, um, you look at a phone like the iPhone 5C for $99 and say, how much lower can they go? But it's not really $99. It's really whatever $400. We're, it's just below, we don't see below the waterline because the subsidy makes it seem cheaper than it actually is. And that hurts Apple. I mean, Apple is going to sell a lot of iPhones now that they're on, on uh, China Mobile in China. But uh, in large parts of the world, including China, uh, people can't afford an iPhone. The iPhone is, is a luxury good in a way that it isn't really in the U.S., and um, because of the subsidy thing. And that puts Apple at a big disadvantage to Android. And, and, you know, market share isn't everything, but the lower Apple can push down with a good product and be, you know, aspirational, be cheaper luxury, I guess I would say. Apple doesn't need to play everywhere, but I would say cheaper luxury um, so that, that the world doesn't become so overwhelmingly Android. Um, I, would, I would say Apple needs to watch its developers. And I would say in, Apple needs to watch... Um, it's and do better at services. I think that goes without saying because Apple doesn't need to be number one in phone OS market share or even mobile OS market share. However, if Apple gets behind on developers, if the app market shifts and Apple starts losing developers or the app experience on the most popular Android phones is closer to on Apple's devices, then Apple is going to have a much harder time because that's Apple's greatest advantage right now is that Apple doesn't just have, I mean, because there's high-end Android hardware too. Um, and, and Apple's very competitive with high-end Android hardware. And the stuff that's taking large market share away from Apple overseas is not high-end Android hardware. It's not devices that are comparable to the iPhone. However, the other big advantage is the apps, and the apps are way better. And fragmentation makes it harder, but Google is making a lot of strides there. So, you know, I, I would say Apple just needs to keep playing the game where iOS is the best place for apps, is the best place for people who are willing to spend a little bit more for a phone to get something better, and then keep pushing that level down so that while they don't need to win the market share game, they need to be you know, have a decent market share with a, a, a good core audience of, of, of users who want to buy apps and, you know, buy movies and buy music on the phone. And then Apple and remain profitable. And I, I think Apple will be fine. On the Mac side, you know, I think Apple just needs to keep on keeping on because the computer market is a little bit static and people buy them, but it's not, um, I want, you know, I want Retina on the desktop. I want Retina on the MacBook Air. I think that'll all happen and it's inevitable. Maybe some of that will happen next year. Retina Air would be great. And, you know, services could be better. Um, iCloud needs to be a lot better. Um, I hope they're rethinking. I think Steve Jobs' attitude to the to cloud and to services is one of those areas that they should be reevaluating among all the things they're reevaluating about the way Steve did things because the cloud stuff still is not good uh, mm -hmm. in large part and they need to do a better job and their lunch is being eaten by uh, all sorts of competitors. And, you know, I use Dropbox every day and I, d I use iCloud never. <laughs> so <laughs> I think they need to, I, I think they got a lot of work to do there. Uh, but, you know, Apple is a wildly profitable company. I think they the number one thing would be probably uh, not to make a list. <laughs> uh, don't be complacent and don't just do repeat things because they worked in the past. And yeah, it would be really nice if they came out with a new groundbreaking product of some sort next year. But I don't think that's the going to, uh, unlike many pundits, I'm not going to say that's going to be their success or failure. People out there will, but they'll, they'll be wrong probably. One comment you said in there that I wanted to ask for clarification. I think I know what you meant. You said watch their developers. Watch them as in take care of them. Watch them as in watch them. Watch, watch them as take care of them. Watch them as make sure that they aren't having a uh, better experience or aren't intrigued by the Android experience. Because I think that developers are, are, I think the iOS developers are Apple's ace in the hole against Android because the developers are knowledgeable about Apple's platform. They like it. Even when developers also do Android versions, you can tell that they're frustrated and they do as they do it because they have to, but they don't usually bring the love to it. And that's a great place. Apple needs to keep doing that. Apple needs to, sh to sh keep showing the love to iOS developers and make sure that Google doesn't, um, you know, romance them too much because 
you know that that I that's a huge advantage for them, and I, I think it will continue. But if I were at Apple, that would be one of my areas of of, of concern. Is I think that the uh, third party developers are a huge asset for Apple on iOS, and they need to um, they need to tend that garden as much as possible. A lot of wisdom in those statements, Jason. Uh, I, I think because I, I like well, I like that that you didn't say they have to introduce you know this X inch iPad or you know this X inch iPhone. Uh, you, you didn't. You, you kind of went higher level, and that's kind of what I was hoping for. So good job. Other than Retina, retina on the desktop and Retina on the MacBook Airs, I, I, I you know the only check mark check mark I can see check box I can see on the hardware for next year right now is get Retina on those devices that don't have it. I would love that. I, yeah. I, you know, I would love that. I don't, you know, I all my iOS devices are Retina, and none of my Macs are. Yeah, and it makes a difference. There's no question. It does. Jason, we will do this again more in 2014. I don't care how busy we both get. Let's do it. Batman versus Spider Man. Oh yeah. All right. <laughs> hey, it's great to see you. Thanks so much, and have a great holiday. You too, Chuck. Thank you very much for having me. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner, he's Jason Snell, and this is Mac Voices, the talk of the Mac community. We'll be back with more soon. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, app.net, Google+, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date with all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com.